you to this this beautiful March evening when the light has begun to return to us in the land we now know as Maine. We at the MAP Library are very honored to be hosting this event and we thank you all for tuning in with us this evening from wherever in the world you are doing so. Um, this is just a reminder that the way that this, I don't know, do we need a reminder one year into the way Zoom functions? Um, but that this is a Zoom webinar, it's a little different than a Zoom meeting. So you will remain as participants um, watching the panelists, your mics remain muted as do your videos. Um, so you will be able to see and hear the panelists for the duration of the program. Um, and they're gonna present for around an hour and then we're gonna go into a question and answer. So this evening you'll have an opportunity to type questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We welcome you to do that. We'll take those questions at the end and we'll get to as many as we can before the program ends at 7.30 p.m. I wanted to just take a moment to introduce my co-host and my co-moderator this evening, my colleague and friend, Jared Lank. Jared is a registered member of the Acadia First Nation Band of Mi'kmaq and currently works as a policy analyst for the Maine Economic Improvement Fund at the University of Southern Maine. He has a BA in geography and anthropology from USM and a master's in policy planning and management from USM's Muskie School of Public Service. He is an accomplished photographer and a deeply spatial thinker. Um, and it's really my pleasure to have him joining me tonight in this program. Um, and I wanted to offer Jared a chance to offer a welcome as well. Hi everyone, uh, thanks Libby, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to help uh, co-moderate this panel discussion. Uh, I'm super interested in the work to be discussed. Um, and I think it's a really important conversation to be had. And as someone who works at the university, I think it's, uh, it makes me very hopeful and happy to see um, increased indigenous presence, both in um, programming that we have at the university and also um, just throughout campus and the, you know, normalizing our existence and coexistence with everyone else in that space that otherwise might not um, have had it previously. So it's a pleasure and honor to be here and help uh, co-moderate. And I'm uh, very excited to hear what everyone has to say and to hear about the work that went into this. Thanks. Thank you, Jared. And it's my pleasure to, to work with you and to do a lot more exciting things coming uh, coming in the future. So before Jared and I work to uh, briefly introduce the panelists and turn over the program to who you actually want to hear from, um, we would just like to both offer uh, land acknowledgement for Machigan, the truest name in Maliseet poet Miku Paul's words of the now called city of Portland, Maine, where we sit currently, he and I, um, and me at the Osher Map Library and Smith Center for Cartographic Education on USM's campus. And just acknowledging that we actually sit on land that was once water and once part of a water-based ecosystem that thousands of years before anyone from Europe set foot on the neck provided for the indigenous peoples of the Don land, the Wabanaki, and from those who were here from the beginning in kinship with the land and the water. And we'd like to acknowledge this truth as we acknowledge the contemporary presence of our friends and our colleagues of the Abenaki, Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Mi'kmaq, and Maliseet peoples, the Wabanaki Confederacy. And also as we take a moment to acknowledge the devastation of settler colonialism past and present, um, and that, that this acknowledgement is, is but a beginning to our collective work. And so we thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And we would like to offer our, our warmest welcome in a digital way. <laughs> I wish we were all here together, sitting together, going out to dinner together, but those days will come, come mm -hmm. soon enough. Um, and I will just introduce um, the panelists and then we will turn it over completely to them for the, for the run of the show. Carol Dana is Penobscot, language, Penobscot Nation language master, an accomplished language teacher, writer, poet, and storyteller. She travels and speaks locally and nationally um, on this work. It's, it's a true privilege to be able to hear from her this evening. Her latest book, 
Still They Remember Me, Penobscot Transformer Tales, Volume One, a collaboration with Margot Lukens and Connor Quinn, who's also here with us this evening, will be out this summer from the University of Massachusetts Press. And I am very much looking forward to that publication, Carol. James Francis, senior, is tribal historian and director of cultural and historic preservation for the Penobscot Nation. He's also a highly sought after artist who works across physical and digital media. On a personal note, I will let the many hundreds of people here with us tonight know that James is also my favorite person to look at maps with. And I'm so glad that the day has finally come back to us when we can look at them in person again together as we got to do last Thursday in the map library. Um, that gives me a lot of hope in many ways. Um, Gabriel Paul, who offered us the beautiful opening greeting, works for the Penobscot Nation Cultural and Historic Preservation Department. He's been involved in language revitalization projects for 20 years. Both of his grandmothers spoke fluent Passamaquoddy and in his childhood is where his interest in learning his native language began. Margaret Pierce is a citizen Potawatomi Nation tribal member and a cartographer living in Katawamkeg, Great Landing Place, also known as Rockland, Maine. Welcome to you, Margaret. Margaret. And Connor Quinn is a documentary and revitalization linguist and teacher currently teaching here at USM as an adjunct assistant professor in the linguistics department. He has been, since he was a teenager, collaboratively working on a Penobscot dictionary. And as I mentioned before, he is collaborating with Carol and with Margot on um, the new annotated edition um, of Penobscot literature that will, that will come to us in print this summer. So thank you all. I am going to mute myself, turn it over to the panelists, and thanks to everyone who's joining us tonight. Should I just start? My favorite place, my favorite. These are the names of some of my favorite places and my favorite part of mapping was going on the land with Margaret. We went to uh, Cape Jellison area and there was a Zahatig or something to that effect. The stepping ashore place where our people stopped on their way down from the river to the ocean and left a message of how many were in the party, what clan they were, and where they would be camping. And I felt sad. I think it was a blood memory. My cousin's been talking about this, and I think that's what it was. I felt a sadness that our people couldn't do that any longer. And there was a fort at the top of the hill. And uh, Margaret was saying these birch trees might have been here and might have been witness to that, you know. And uh, there's other places on the map, Gukski, Bedige. Uh, it means come in to the cedars. Bedige is how they used to say it a long time ago. And it's where John Neptune went into exile in Brewer by the river, I think him and Molly. And Owanajo is Blue Hill. And when I go there, uh, thanks to certain people there, I feel like I'm coming home. I feel really good in that area. And Gwanasquamkitook was the old name for uh, the island here, a long, narrow strip of land. You know, when you're downstreet, uh, that's how the land is there. And it's where uh, you would come if you came from Old Town by the canoe, which, uh, you know, came right to that area. Wazumke, yes, we were looking for Wazumke, Margaret and I, and uh, we had been to Jellison, Cape Jellison, and we were moving down the ocean, but we had to go to Moose Point to look back from where we came, and I think it was around the Sears Island area, 
And I was so excited. I go, there it is, Margaret. And along that shore, because wazumke means a shining gravel, it looked like a long silver looking line, you know, the whole shoreline. And we were so excited. <laughs> Another place we uh, hope had hoped to go to was Ginapskadene, I guess they call it Waldo Mountain. And James had told us there's a road going up there, but we never made it. And I love that area when we drive, when I drive through facing north, uh, coming through there, you can see the hills. And every time I go through there, I can almost feel uh, ancestors up there looking out. I really think, you know, they were watching out at that time. And I have an affinity for that Sandy River area, but I had a funny uh, feeling there once too about uh, people being chased and children. I think that's what they call a blood memory. And the Bis Biscataquis is a little branch river. I think I named one of my grandchildren that. And uh, it's where we get Piscataquis means the many branches. And I'm just talking about some words that have meaning for me, like that Sawadopska, you know, I understand that one. And uh, I think some of our guys have gone down here in canoe and uh, went on that stream. And my favorite one is Penjajawag because Frank had told me in the 80s, it was the water tumbling over the ledges and the uh, I've yet to go there. There's a land preserve in Essex Street that goes through there and it goes way down nearby where I used to meditate at the green, was it Emerald or? There was a big building there, uh, right near the road going to the river. And uh, it must be a long stretch there, but Penjajawag is in that area. And I just loved it. And I just wanted to say that and gather my stuff, my uh, my thoughts, and uh, I'll just chime in with people as we go along. Aliwini. There's so much more to it, <laughs> but those were highlighted by my memory. Oh, and uh, Kinio is in the stories. Some of our stories talk about land areas. And uh, I wanna say that that is a sacred place that even warring tribes went there and there was peace there because they all wanted the same thing. Even the Mohawks went there because there's a certain type of flint that is there and uh, Toma gave my son a big chunk of that once. Um, oh, I can see, Keen Toma. So that, you know, is a quite a beautiful area, uh, focal land, landmark in our stories and today, and, you know, our people still live there. Anybody else? Kind of all I had. Yeah. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Mm -hmm. I just wanted to um, kind of share the genesis of um, a map that Margaret will be sharing, the one we worked on together. Um, it started for um, me many years ago with uh, all, all the way on the left, you can see this hand-drawn map uh, with the, the blue, the river. And um, I started to collect these from um, research and whether it was Thoreau's Maine Woods or uh, Joseph Treat's uh, survey of the state of Maine in 1820 with um, John Neptune, um, Fanny Hardy Eckstorm's book. So I started compiling these, um, but the subsequent maps, the Penobscot Place Names map in the middle, the white one, and then uh, the Penobscot Way, which was published in the Bangor Daily News, um, was a collaboration with the um, language program. So we uh, decided to go from Kanduskeg to um, Pasadumkeg on the, the second map, the one in the middle, and then um, really capture Penobscot uh, watershed 
uh, within the, the Penobscot Way. And, um, you know, this uh, research just uh, continues. Even, even uh, this week, I've been corresponding with Connor about a couple of place names up, up, uh, up on the east branch of the Penobscot. Um, but the, the map we're talking about today, it was um, even further. It, it goes beyond uh, the watershed and really incorporates, um, you know, portage routes. And um, I think it's just a really, um, you know, a, a testament to, you know, a lot of uh, great work over the years, um, both uh, from myself, but also uh, for the um, language program. And uh, uh, Wiliwani, I thank you for all your assistance. I couldn't have done it without um, Gabe, Carol, Connor, Margaret. Mm -hmm. Gabe, you want to chime in? He's muted. Uh, hey, um, I was going to let Margaret go if she wanted to. Do we wizzy gobble out, Paul, and the Jawi or Banoopskig? Cause it's Wagudum, the Hamawagudum. Much new leader has you die, uh, Mina Taldun Cabinayo. Um, my name's Gabriel Paul from where the rocks widen or where the white rocks are up on a uh, Penobscot uh, nation and um, Crow Clan and Eel Clan. And <clears throat> I always try to practice uh, introducing myself in that way um, because, you know. Some of uh, the elders were talking about our relatives about how this ties you into the land and ties you into your roots and where you come from, and um, and acknowledges all of your family, your grandparents, and where they come from too. And uh, I think the work that's been done on this place name map is um, a huge part of that. Of of reconnecting and rooting our, ourselves back into the land. Um, <clears throat> I was reading some stuff, trying to freshen up. It's been a little while with doing some of the place name stuff, um, but I came across this uh, quote of indigenous place names are powerful vehicles for narrating history and inscribing the landscape with meaning. And I think that's a pretty powerful statement and kind of sums it up, you know, briefly of, of um, these, these place names maps and some of the places Carol touched on. And uh, we can really see like in the Glue Scabe stories that people aren't familiar with them. Um, Glue Scabe was the first uh, being created and he's uh, the person who um, kind of we learn from of our, the morals and our values and shape the landscape. And a lot of the place names kind of came from those different stories and grandma Woodchuck and um, the first son and the first mother. And, and uh, so these, <clears throat> these place names, uh, I was thinking about like um, reconnecting, like, I, you know, growing up, it was this Indian Island but then it was like, wait, this is Bunawapskeg, you know? Like, hey, the, over here, this is Buzzy Dumpkick. Or down here, hey, hey, over here, look at, this is Zuckhaes, Zunkhaes. Mm -hmm. And then it just starts kind of taking you on this uh, trail, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like river system of, of place names. And, and um, you start to discover uh, the meaningful places too takes you takes you around and really um, descriptive of the land and and uh, so I just want to share that much for right now I got some more but um, I want to let some other people fill in fill in here oh uh, you reminded me Gabe of uh, 
my grandfather, our grandfather, James and mine, uh, trapped in the Sunkays area. And uh, Frank used to say it's so crooked in there, that stream you could shake hands, the bowman and the stern man could shake hands when they were going in. And uh, he trapped in that area a lot. And when we did the New Alliance story, it said that he had died in Birch Stream. And it was, how did they say? Anyway, Margot found out there is a Birch Stream in that area of Sun Cays. And cause we all know it on the west side, right? On the other side, the Birch Stream where we still go, which was called Chi Keegan a long time ago because it grew tubers over there. And the men still hunt there, and there's a big deer yard there. But uh, it was interesting to find that out. And uh, I talked to my neighbor, and she said, Oh, yeah, dad and his friends used to talk about that area, Sun Caves. Uh, they, you know, hunted and trapped in there too back in the day. Oui, Winnie. I'll jump in. Um, bonjour, Jayek. Kosakwe in Dejnikas. Bodwe Wadmi Ndao. Shishi Bani Ndao. Makolan Dodum. Kedawam Keg Ndeda. Gaskasago Ndochbia. I'm Margaret Pierce. I I had the great honor of working with everyone here on this map. And probably if it seems like we're trying to remember it's because we started this project 10 years ago. <laughs> I was thinking about it, it was a really long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, I think James, it was 2010, we started talking about maybe expanding uh, the place names map. I think it was fall 2010. Um, and then we applied for funding and we got a grant from the Franklin, a Franklin research grant from the American Philosophical Society. And that was like a, um, enough funding to get us started the first summer. And I came out to the island and rented a room and everyone gave me a desk uh, next to Carol and started working on the map and um, working with whatever people gave me and beginning from James's maps and the goal being simply to widen out from there, from what um, James had already started mm -hmm. and getting to know people on the island and um, you know, Bing Wang and GIS department was a was an important part of that work as well. He gave us a lot of digital data to work with. Um, and then just briefly from there, I got to be there all summer working. The following summer came back, uh, worked again, didn't get to stay on the island that time, but um, continued working on the map. And then for the next two years, we didn't have any funding. Um, we applied for a um, tribal heritage grant from the National Park Service, didn't get that grant. And so basically it came down to, I had to quit my job and then move to Maine and arrive at Carol's house and say, I'm not leaving until this map is finished. <laughs> that's the, that's the short, the short story. Anyway, that's the that's the brief rundown on on how it all got started, um, and that last so that we finished it in 2015 that spring and summer, and that was when um, Connor became a big part of that work. We really, Connor came up and worked really intensively in the department yeah. on the place names, um, and then leaving and going over everything by email. But it was all of us really um, coming together and really focusing on that in spring of 2015 that got the map finished. 
Thank God for Connor, because <laughs> some things I didn't know, that's for sure. Yeah, it was good. Yeah. That would be a good segue to you, Connor. Yeah, it was okay. It's well, quite the segue. <laughs> um, thanks, Julie and Carol. Yeah. Um, well, um, it's Misha Crocher, Crocher McMichael Quinn. Um, so say it in and could you smoke and come hinge it? This um, Nish and Thomas America. So, um, my name is Connor Connor McDonough Quinn. Better part of my ancestors are from Ireland, and here we are. Um, on this continent. Um, I mentioned that not just because of what Gabe said, well, or actually it's part and parcel of what Gabe said, because my entrance to all this kind of work as a non-native person is because I, when I was around 12 or so, um, my mom still had books on her shelves when she was in her 20s learning, going to learn Irish, our ancestral language. And so I started in learning my own ancestral language, which notwithstanding my mom's attempts hasn't really been spoken in about three or four generations. Um, and, um, and that's what got me into just like interested in languages and then I became a linguist and all that jazz. But when I um, got involved in a long and complicated story of how I got involved with uh, Penobscot people, Penobscot language, um, um, a big motivation for me is because like, like the history of the Irish under colonialism is very different, needless to say, than say um, what people on this continent have had to deal with. Um, but there are some similarities and a sense of some common ground, to say the least. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what got me interested in, 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 um, in, in helping out and doing this kind of work. Um, I always sort of say to myself and, um, and I've always said to anyone who asked that one of the reasons why I work in this kind of work is because I would always want a 12 year old Penobscot kid to have the same opportunity with their language that I got to have with mine. Um, and so that's my relation to this. And I bring that up because uh, most of the work I'm trying to do these days is working in a like relational, uh, having a relational approach to everything that we do. So trying to think in terms of people's relation to the land, trying to think in terms of their relation, therefore, to the words for the land, the names of the place of the land. Um, and I work now most days in, 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 with um, the folks you see on the screen and a bunch of other different communities on matters of language reclamation. And there we often talk about how reclamation of language is reclamation of territory. It's reclamation of territory of the heart and the mind. It's like when we reclaim our language, whoever we are, um, when we reclaim our language, it's like we've replaced, reclaimed the space for us, for you and me to like relate to each other in the ways we do in our language, not just the language of um, the variety of colonizers. And there can be layers of that, right? Yeah. And then a reclamation of place names is a reclamation of all of that. It's a reclamation of language and of the relations to the land itself. And those can be rich and complex. So that's what I work on mostly these days. Um, and that's the kind of, uh, and I'm wicked grateful that uh, over all these years, I mean, it would be Carol who, uh, who I got to meet first and Carol I've definitely spent the most time with and then not long, and then not super long after that, Gabe, who I've uh, gotten to know since, God, since you were 16, and James right around the same time, actually. I just ended up, at, me and Carol um, did a class together almost 20 years ago, uh, 20 mm -hmm. years ago, and Gabe, which Gabe came in as a, as a 16 year old. So he's not kidding when he said he's been interested since he was young. And then I met James because he was uh, doing, already doing the work that he's been doing now back then. Mm -hmm. um, and then Margaret, uh, I think I got to meet, well, Margaret told the story, told the story of that. Um, I don't know if, I, as everyone knows, I always have plenty more to say. So <laughs> I, can, I, I can stop there if anyone has any questions about word building or some of the issues from my perspective in terms of, in terms of um, trying to recover and help people reclaim the words. I don't know if you want to hear about that now or in the Q&A. Yeah. One. Well, I was grateful to you, Connor, because some of those words had got corrupted, as you know, through time, and I couldn't make sense out of some of them. And uh, I remember when you came in and uh, Margaret, you and I were there talking and uh, you filled in a lot of the spaces, you know, that uh, I couldn't, you know, when I was glad uh, that we could do that. And uh, it's just so hard because uh, 
like Allagash, Allagash, right? Mm -hmm. Who would know that that word was Wallagask bark yeah. because someone had built a bark wigwam up there and that's where it got its name. You know, that's how it can change from one from one time to the other. I had a little joke that uh, I had read in a book about a man and a woman riding around Maine and they come to this place where there's three roads and they're unmarked and they didn't know where they went. And she said, go in that general store and ask where those roads go. So he went in and he said, no, if I take this road on the left, where does it go? And I think they said Maquaha. Well, if I take the one in the middle, where does that go? Pass it um keg. What about the one on the right? And uh, he said, with a pet lock. So he went back in the car and his wife said, well, what did they tell you? He said, I don't know. The man can't speak a word of English. I thought that was great. <laughs> you know, and I've often wondered about those names and uh, I was intrigued by uh, Vermont maps with Abenaki names back mm. in the day too. And uh, it's just been interesting. And I like it when uh, there's a little story or something, you know, about the land because I think our people uh, traveled it. Well, I know they traveled it extensively. Frank told me that go to uh, uh, Chardier to go to Quebec they were asking for a priest. And he also told me that if you had a priest or a mission, you didn't get killed and you got to eat. I mean, he didn't mince words, you know, when he told me. And uh, he pointed out those uh, riverways, you know, the people traveled on. And uh, it was all interesting to me and to know, you know, where the people, uh, the ground they covered. And there's a story about Neptune even being up in Hudson, him and some men. And uh, people up there trying to say, what are you doing here, you know? And I think he stood his ground with them, you know, and they, they stayed. I don't know if they were trapping or what, but people were trying to run them out of there. And I just love all those stories. I think when there's a story, I'm more, uh, apt to remember it, you know, or an attachment. And I wish we had more of our stories with the place names, because I think it was you, Margaret, that told me about that book of that man. Uh, can't remember his name. It begins with K, but if you were having a problem or you and I were talking and I would say, oh, but remember, uh, the story and then start quoting or telling that part of the story to them because they were reminding them of something that happened. And I thought that was so neat. Do you remember that, Margaret? Yeah, I think you're thinking of Wisdom Sits in Places by Keith Basso. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That was neat, I thought. I thought that was so great. And we have Gabe's son, Kino, with uh, what was that name, Gabe Kinawampkeg? Land of the Kino? Um, Kinawakamuk. Oh, Kinawakamuk. Yeah. And uh, what you just mentioned, Carol, um, about the land holding stories, and when you either take people out on, on those patches, pieces of land or pots of land, or you even just talk about them, but definitely, especially when people get a chance to go out on them. Yeah. And all the stories come back. Yeah. Um, one of the words I learned when in learning Irish, reclaiming my own language, is the word dinchanachas, which is the Irish word for exactly that. It's like the stories of the land, and it's, it's an important part of Irish civilization, Irish culture, mm -hmm. um, that like every place has a name and then the name is about name recalls the story of something that happened there something recent history something more in ancient times history something with giants something with yeah. monsters all and every corner of ireland has that and yeah. um and it's it's as people are getting that back it, I, I feel like it, it makes a huge difference in people's feeling like yeah. Uh, land back and their relations to the land back. Yeah, Spencer Mountain, Big Spencer and Little Spencer intrigued me because uh, one was Gliscod's backpack. 
but uh -huh. I don't know the whole story that that comes from. And people will know it, you know, and then Bamola up there in the uh, Katahdin area, there's Pomola Peak. And uh, Frank told me, well, in our story, Guska stamps a moose out of the ground. And Frank said that one of our old beliefs was that all hoofed animals came out of Chimney Pond. Oh. Yeah, and uh, the last caribou were seen in that area. And he said, well, that makes sense because, you know, they came out of Chimney Pond, but he knows they left because uh, the food that they fed on was gone. And that's why they left and the university tried to bring them back. But I'm know. gonna share the, share the map because you're telling stories that are in the map. How about that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, so um, the stories Carol's talking about is uh, Goose Gup and the Moose, and he's uh, teaching people how to how to hunt moose, and he, he shoots a cow moose that turns into stone, which becomes uh, Mount Kineo, and then um, that moose is with a calf, and the calf um, tips over a kettle that Goose Gup had ready to cook the moose in, and uh, it becomes... Um, uh, Kettle Mountain for a long time, um, but now it's called Little Spencer. And then Goose Gop throws his backpack off and it becomes Big Spencer. And then he uh, chases the moose across the landscape to Penobscot Bay, where we um, have several um, place names that relate to this, this story. Yeah. But um, part, of, um, part of what you folks were talking about earlier about um, you know, the different types of uh, stories that come out of place names. Um, and I've read um, Keith Basso's book and um, I was, I was kind of relieved when I first read it because he, he talks about that place names offer kind of geographic or geologic description, which we got a lot of because um, they're kind of travel markers and we were uh, a mobile culture. We, we moved kind of seasonally across the land. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, um, also natural resources based, you know, what, what type of product can you get there? And sometimes it's, it's land use. Um, but Basso also talks about that there are stories that um, kind of teach a lesson that there are places that when you uh, hear about those places in the language, it uh, recalls a story. Um, the one I remember is um, where they sit in shades of shit. And it's about these two families and uh, adjacent families and they're growing corn and one family has an abundance of corn and the other the other family doesn't they they get a very bad crop and so the family with um with all the corn didn't share and desperate times and so the the family who was hungry held them hostage in their own homes mm. and they said oh you know never mind them we got our food here we got our corn and so it, it becomes a, a messy situation for them but um, I often thought about why we don't see that in a lot of our place names here. And, and I think it's because a lot of the place names that we have uh, retained um, come from when people are guiding uh, non-Native people and telling those types of stories um, to a visitor uh, may have been inappropriate, that you wouldn't share those kind of moral type of uh, place stories uh, with them. Mm -hmm. But it's just a just a theory. Yeah, I'm sure there's other stories. You know, like the Atian clan territory was in uh, Chisuncook and uh, Jiro Island. You know, uh, people always want to uh, retain that or get that back. Right. And I wondered why we had that story of Moosehead and uh, chasing the moose and why it went way to Cape Rosier. Oh, I want to mention that I picked grass there and uh, my friends here and her boy play on this big rock. And it was just lately I read another spin-off story of uh, Cape Rosier. Now, how did that go? Uh, that big rock was uh, Guscob's dog. And every time we go there and I bring my grandson, him and the boy, 
a play on this big rock. And I go, maybe that was Gliscob's dog. You know, it was right there in plain sight and so obvious, you know, and uh, it just made me laugh. I go, that was probably it. And I told you about going to Castine, but you can tell that story better, James, looking for another big rock on the shore and then you see five or six and you don't know which is which. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, part of that story after uh, Gluskov, he chases that calf moose to the bay and he has snowshoes on. He's got his dog in tow and he jumps over the bay and he lands at a place called Dice Head. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they said he landed with such force that his um, snowshoes made uh, imprints in the rock. Mm -hmm. And so um, I went there and um, walked down over the, you know, past the lighthouse. They had a nice set of stairs there and went down there and um, saw, saw this place. And, um, you know, I've taken geology classes and I understand how, how, uh, you know, things were formed geologically. Um, and, um, but there's quartzite all interlaced into the rock and it looks just like the webbing of snowshoes. And someone asked me, well, do you believe that story or do you believe um, in science? And I said, well, it didn't matter. Once I saw the place, I knew that it, that was the place they were talking about. Yeah. And um, in it, it's um, cultural um, when uh, feeding your dog, you would always feed them the entrails and you wouldn't feed them hand to mouth. You would actually throw the entrails to, to the dog. And um, so Gluskop th kills the, the calf uh, at Cape Rozier and he throws the entrails to his dog who were, was on the, um, the island that's um, in between two bodies of water. And it, it lands on the shore, and there's a large quartz um, encrusted rock there that you can actually see across uh, from across the bay. Um, and it was actually kind of a um, a travel marker because it was so close to the the portage route that got you uh, across the island. And so uh, you would use it as a beacon as you were paddling in the bay to get to that portage. Um, and the, the red lines you see on the map are actually um, their uh, canoe routes and the circles uh, denote, uh, you know, or the dotted lines denote carries uh, where you'd have to get out of your canoe and, um, you know, carry it over a body of water or whatever. This is my favorite. You want to speak to the liver? Well, I, we wouldn't have thrown the liver away. We ate the liver. I don't believe that. I think uh, Haviland is ad libbing on our stories. <laughs> you have to have a discerning mind. That's the first thing we always took to my aunt was the liver. Yeah, what I find interesting about this is over here where there's a bird is, is struck into the rock. And so this um, little pond um, just above it, there was a carry trail that went from what's called punch bowl which is that little um uh there's a little kind of cove there and they called it punch bowl oh. and there was a um there was a carry there and um to mark where that carry was because it was highland you couldn't even tell there was a, a lake back there from the from the channel yeah. uh they they pecked a bird in the rock and um it's no longer there because when uh the colonists and um, decided they were going to harvest ice from that pond. They used the portage trail to move the ice from the pond to the um, to the water, and they they built a, a large dock or uh, a wharf system uh, so they could get the ice on the boats. And that bird um, showed up missing at that time. So mm -hmm. somebody probably has it somewhere. Yeah. I wanted to mention for people who haven't seen the map that there's a reason it's all in Penobscot on one side and all in English on the other side because this map is for language learning. And we talked about it and thought that if 
it was in the language and then immediately translated into an English meaning, then those Penobscot that people would go right to the English and bypass the language. Mm -hmm. So it's separated with English on the back. Yeah. So you get the feeling when you read the English side of what it feels like to be fluent and inspired to learn the other side. And then there's a gazetteer that goes with it. You can see here, there's a gazetteer that um, brings the two together mm -hmm. in case you feel overwhelmed. Uh, I have a question for Gabe or Connor, but the old name for Bar Harbor area was Pometic. What does that mean? No, there's uh, Bamadnik. Oh, Bamadnik. Oh, Bamadnik. Yeah, like along the hills. Mm. Oh. Uh, the one you were just talking about, because uh, I actually, when we were compiling these, I went through the David Francis um, landscapes, place names, yes. CD Rome. Yeah. And uh, it was really nice because you could hear him say the words and then talk about what, how he translated it. Yeah. And that was one of my favorite place names was the um, where the bird pecked into the rock. Yeah. The zip, zip, yeah, zip, zip, edelopski, the hazard. That's it. Nice. I, I wrote it down because I wanted to share. This was ex his exact words. He goes, Zip says, I do the hazard. He said, Peck right into the rock, hidden something like this. Tap, tap, tap. Carved in the rock. Bird carved in the rock. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, people that don't know who David Francis um, or Martin, he uh, was a big. Um, knew a lot of language. He, he helped develop the Passamaquoddy Dictionary. And there was a huge um, amount of Passamaquoddy place names, Beskromokadi, all along the coast. Yeah. And I was talking about, at some point, we want to, want to collaborate all the Wabanaki wow. place names and wow. just put them, fill them all through the whole Maritimes, the region, you know. Wow, um, it would be awesome. And I think that we decided on this one was not to include the border. Mm. Yeah. It's a little hard. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. people are used to the gazetteer with the state lines and, yeah. you know, the county lines. and But well, uh, it gives you a different uh, perspective or aspect of um, yeah. exactly that place name is how it was carved into the, to the landscape or like yeah. the snowshoe, the augum. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think the moose is such a huge um, important part of our culture and our livelihood of why we, we were able to survive in this um, landscape. So it's so fitting to see that, you know, parts of this moose um, is still given, giving us, you know, gave us flint, given these uh, different landscapes and, mm -hmm. um, the other one that I liked was if you can go into the Som Sound, mm -hmm. Margaret. It's over by another side of Bar Harbor. <clears throat> but that was my other one. I one of my favorite. There it is. That long word with all the eyes. B B G G G we busy big way. It took me like two days to learn that from David <laughs> Gordon. <laughs> There's like 11 eyes in it. Yeah. And he says it's a long, narrow, calm inlet bay. Uh, yeah. And, they, and uh, that dialect, coastal dialect, the, you can make the word longer. So like be beach air is like a long time ago or beachy like something long mm -hmm. so the longer you put the b you know like beach air, they said it's like longer ago <laughs> what does that mean coastal dialect um well i said for like the pollock um 
Passamaquoddy people, well, our people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because we were coastal too. Oh, I was thinking of those men that came, Gabe, that time and wanted to do a comprehensive map like that, including Abenaki names and go right into Canada. I don't remember who they were, but I think part of the angle was getting money from Canada and over here too. Well, I was just um, reading an article about uh, up in the Northwest of uh, Canada, and like what happened over there was a land surveyor mm -hmm. just started like he said, oh, this is these names are subhuman and they're uh, they're going to go extinct anyways. So he started naming them after himself and his employees and his children. Oh. And uh, his name was Otto Klotz. And uh, that's what happened over there. But I guess the Providence now they put it in the um, law to uh like 2000 something names were declared uh, um you know you can it's public it's um on the maps i don't know what the term you would use but uh so i was thinking about that like what they're doing over there to reclaim and mm -hmm. what we you know what movements we how fortunate we are even though we've had a lot longer contact on this coast yeah that, or that we know of yeah. that we still have so many place names that were left over even though they are like corrupted yeah like, on the highway you see pass a gas a walk egg mm -hmm. right so that's like you know you get up that one's pretty close buzz a gas a walk yeah buzz a gas a walk egg, like the dark covered land yeah and someone had asked what the keg is like the K-E-A-G mm -hmm. uh, at the ending of a lot of names is uh, to my understanding it's like the locative yeah. ending of the word. Yeah. Gives Need it at in or on. Keeg. Hmm. James, do you want to talk about Elders Cafe? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. So um <clears throat> so we were um we were feeding our elders dinner and showing them old pictures. Um, and we had been doing that for, um, you know, for a couple of years at this point. And so we decided that we wanted to interact with the elders and in the community, have dinner, and then um, build a map of our community, Indian Island, and name the places. I mean, we all grew up there. We, we knew where Horses Bridges, uh, Bridge was. Um, we knew where the ball field was, uh, first, second ledge, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this project was the first time that uh, we as a community uh, named those places and put them on a map. And so this is what you see here, uh, El, El Nabe Menahan. Um, but this was a lot of fun because it really, um, it spawned a lot of stories, actually. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it brought us, brought us together. I really enjoyed that. Yeah. I was, I want to say that um, my first, when I first came to the island that summer and, um, you know, one of the lessons for me on the, one of the many lessons for me working on this project is um, learning how to hear what people were telling me. <laughs> and I remember Carol, the first week, Carol, you took me all around the island and you were like, here's first ledge, here's second ledge, um, here's Elizabeth Shore, you took me all around, here's Joe Pease, named every place, we went back and we we're like, okay, now we're gonna work on place names. And you had just told me all these place names. <laughs> um, but then at that time, my ears couldn't, weren't hearing them as, as Penobscot place names. Mm. It was a learning process for me. Yeah. Yeah, I love how it says Overtown. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. I, I like how in that one old recording of um, Arthur Neptune and Andrew Dana talking, they have a single verb that means to go over town. It's mm -hmm. a single word. Yeah. And I remember 
I would have never figured that out had I not been spending like a whole bunch of summers with you guys and hearing you guys saying that in English. Because yeah. like it's only used in the English of your community, that phrase, I'm going over, I'm going over town. Where I heard that elsewhere was Barbara Jean would say agamak. Don't mm -hmm. you agamak? Mm -hmm. I, I need to go to the other shore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's at Gwen, Gwen Squawkamigak. It's like mm. a London area. I think St. Andrews has a name like that too, Gabe, Gwen Squawkamigak. Do you remember the name for St. Andrews, New Brunswick? Gwen Squamkuk, right? I, I've heard that. I, I heard that. That rings a bell for me too, yeah. 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 Gwen Squamkuk. Something like that. The questions in the Q&A are, as the kids might say, blowing up. Um, okay. So I'm wondering if we can, um, if yeah. we can ask some of them and, and continue the conversation in, in that way. Um, yeah. And Carol, the, the first ones are just love notes to you. So I just <laughs> wanted to share that your fan club is here yeah. and they are telling you that they love you uh, oh my gosh. and thanking you um, for sharing your, your stories at the, at the beginning. Um, and Jared, I know that you had a question you wanted to kick off with, so I want to turn it over to you. Yeah, um, I have a million questions. I think this is all <laughs> just so amazing. Um, on a before you know, I get into the question, I just want to say this is um, very you know personally. I appreciate this a lot, and you sharing this with me. Um, I was never taught the language. Um, it was lost in my family. My grandparents spoke it and refused to teach it. So um, it just means a lot to hear the stories um, and the the experience of place. And I think that that <clears throat> is something that I I cherish a lot in this type of work. Is and it's a huge differentiation in all of this. Hearing you all talk about your experience creating this is that the language is very much our history and how we interact with this place and how we continue to do so. And I thought it was so interesting to James's point there at the end that it's not only just cultural preservation, but the continuation of naming places as they're used, you know? Um, so I just wanted to say, I really appreciate the time and effort and uh, you've all put into this and sharing it with us. It's invaluable to me personally. Um, so for my, my first question, um, I know this has been a decade in the making that um, Margaret um, was noting on, and, it, and I know so much has been covered, um, and I know that there's still a lot that you all probably plan to do. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, I know this is a, intended to be used as a tool to, um, for language learning, and my question is kind of multifaceted, is what is the next um, you know, steps in like, what, what are you planning for the future of this work and this project? And how do you see it being used as, um, lang in a, as a language learning tool and um, everything to that effect? And it's open to everybody, whoever feels compelled to answer. Can we dream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This idea of a comprehensive uh, map with all our people's names and there'd be some arguments you know but i like uh martin's map where you can hear the words that would be mm -hmm. great that would be fantastic mm -hmm. i think yeah, one of the things uh that i hear people who have the map uh they're planning canoe trips um all those red lines are um you know canoe routes and they want to um you know, use the, the portage that go from Mattawamkeg and through Baskahegan into the, uh, you know, Passamaquoddy territory or uh, go from Sawadapskook to Sebastakook from the Penobscot to um, the Kennebec. So, um, you know, these maps are, are made to, to be brought in the canoe. Um, I think the, the measurement from side to side was, you know, the, um, the gunnels on the canoe. And um, it's, it's made out of paper that is, uh, you know, uh, called wet strength or some kind of water resistant paper that 
uh, NOAA uses on their uh, nautical maps. And so it was really um, thought out and planned to get people to um, not only um, engage with the map, but get out into the landscape and uh, explore. Um, you know, I think a big part and, you know, Carol's story really highlights this is, um, you know, is, is being out in that landscape. Yeah. Is to be, yeah, especially when, when you're kind of wondering about a place name and you kind of, you, you're, you're looking at it and you've, translated it and you just kind of don't know what it means but then you get out there and it and it's like aha um so i i, I think you know getting out there and um exploring these places is uh really valuable because it really links uh our language to the landscape can i something say something quick to that when carol first said, uh, first said and then we came in was and she was talking about uh, about me being able to fill in some gaps. The thing I wanted to talk about was uh, how many gaps we have from like the linguistic reconstruction side. We have so many gaps. And so basically the fundamental problem is if we, if we heard the word, if we know the word from a fluent speaker, not, you know, who, um, and so forth, then we have the story, we have the word. There's often, you know, there may be some things we still don't understand, but we basically have a pretty good solid count. But when we're, um, getting words from old maps where it was written down by somebody who wasn't a native speaker and maybe wasn't really paying particularly good attention or didn't particularly care, right? That's when we get these forms where we're, we're just kind of, you know, we may be able to make good guesses because we can relate that word to other better known words that ultimately kind of always trace their way back to some knowledgeable speaker directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. um, but the but the, the the main thing is that often what's on the page, the written word, which may be in some cases all that we've got, doesn't have enough information. It's mm. just literally not there. Either the sounds have been misheard, and so we and we could make a few guesses, but we can't be sure. Yeah. But it's when James and everybody else in the team has 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 gone off uh, in those cases where we're, we're um, has gone back to the land and looked at the land and been on the land and and related that. That's the information that's not on the map um, and not in the written word, but that's what brings the, that's what brings the name back and the mm -hmm. meanings of it. So many times uh, is that's what's sort of clinched it for us and said, okay, we think, we've, we think we know this word now. We think we know this name now. Um, it's not linguistic reconstruction from, from glitchy alphabetic writing, mm -hmm. um, but really people going back and, and looking at the place and, and reconnecting to it, connecting or reconnecting to it, or maybe already had a connection to that place, but now with this word, what we think it might mean and so forth, it all finally comes together in the place with the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, what makes that difficult sometimes are um, modern structures, dams, mm -hmm. um, really um, tend to suppress uh, some of the place names because some of those features are underwater that we don't we don't see. Yes, I thought of that when I saw Chip Putnetikook. Uh, Donald had it on Facebook, and I remember talking to Micah about it. There's stone out there, wore down from our people's moccasins traveling a certain route, but I think it's underwater now, and uh, we always want to see that, you know. There was so much traffic in that area. That's awesome. Margaret took me somewhere from uh, Lincolnville up a certain route. And when we got up there, it's just a big rock and uh, looks right out over the bay. What a beautiful scene, scenery there, you know. And uh, you can feel like your people were right there looking out, you know, watching the bay all the time. I can't remember the name of it. She doesn't even remember it. I was so impressed. <laughs> there were horses trying to get up there, but at a certain point you have to walk it, you know, it's total rock up there. Just beautiful. I was just trying to share some photos, but they didn't, I couldn't get my PowerPoint to work. I apologize. I have a great picture of you of traipsing around. You have to imagine. <laughs> Errol, to your dream that you were talking about and, and to Gabe, what Gabe mentioned at the beginning, I just wanted to share two comments in the chat to that end. Um, from, they both come from uh, Patricia Salas and, and she says of what you say about the map with all of the collective place names. She says, I want to do the same. Our places names from across uh, Wabanaki, we should find a way to collaborate while you want. And she also says, 
we have a map already based on waterways that has 200 place names in Malasi, Wolustaque, and, and Mi'kmaq. So oh. I will get her contact information and I will share those via email and, and make that connection. You have many people who want to connect in that way. Yeah, the work's half done. Yeah. Right, yeah. Abenaki too, though. Order. <laughs> Yeah. Um, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say on the Abeniki side, there the two Abeniki authors, Laurent and Masta, at the ends of both of their books, one in 1932 and one in 1884, they have big long sections on place on their local place names in their language too. So, okay. And I'm sure the Abeniki people themselves have even more than what's in those books as well. So, yeah, you're right. It is all just sort of waiting to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 45 more questions. We, we do, we won't, but I'm, I read fast and I can read that many of them are, are similar. So I'll share some of the, I'll try, I'll share some of the similar ones. Um, so Trevana says, this is a, such a gift. Thank you, Wally Wan. One question I have is about the potential, and this is a question a lot of people are asking, the potential to get more of these names on signage and in usage around the region um, she's wondering if that's, they're wondering if that's something that's desired by indigenous folks. And if it is, are there any efforts to continue the process of, of sharing and using and honoring more broadly, legally in community? And similarly, there were others in the chat asking about um, highway signs, sometimes like what you see up in, in Canada. Is there a desire to, to share in, in that way? Are there efforts afoot that anyone is aware of? Yeah, so at the uh, University of Maine, um, we, um, we decolonized uh, the campus at Orono by um, naming places there in, in uh, Penobscot. And um, there's also a, an, an effort to um, start in our own community to um, all the traffic signs uh, in the language. Um, but we're something we've been talking about for many years and uh, there's some reluctancy because there's some, you know, some DOT regs or something that signs have to be, uh, you know, not cluttered with, but who needs to pay attention to that? It's our community. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th there are some efforts and um, I don't know about any, any further than that. Um, you know, like I said, we, we, have done two iterations of this project at the University of Maine, um, which uh, very successful. And uh, now we're talking about uh, bringing that kind of uh, philosophy to our communities. Real quick, um, we are talking about collaborating with, um, well, some of the research that we've done and then collaborating with Nabizan, um, which is a Wabanaki nonprofit in native land and putting the nativeland.ca, people aren't familiar with it. Uh, there's a lot of indigenous place names that's like a virtual map and people can explore the landscape. And um, we're talking about sharing the ones that are already existing, like that are on the highway or, um, you know, my dream someday would be like to have it on a GPS where, you know, you're, you can just cruise along and you're like, oh, hey, you know, is this place is coming up. Let's stop there and uh, say that name again, you know. And Gabe, do you want to talk or James or someone speak to um, place names as cultural property? Because um, we're a lot of talk about sharing, but I think there's also it's important to speak to um, privacy and and not sharing. When not to share? Well, well, I I, th I think that um, there's always going to be some um, discretion when you come across um, some place names that denote uh, important sites, uh, you know, burial grounds, et cetera, et cetera, that um, you don't disclose uh, those locations. Um, you know, I, I think that's that's an important consideration. Yeah. 
Is that the type of thing you were thinking about, Margaret? Um, yes, and I was also thinking about um, sovereignty in terms of your knowledge, because place names are your cultural knowledge, right? And they belong to you, um, and so sometimes it seems seems like there is. Um, it's important to talk about. Uh, when those names can be shared and, and when they're appropriate to be shared. Yeah, that sounds like a bigger meeting than what we could talk about here. I want to mention how you used to tell me, you just healed that word. And I never thought of that. And I didn't think of the work as being healing work, but I can see now how it is because of that memory I had and the feelings I got at that place, the step in the short place and some of the sadness, you know, and some of the things that happen on the land, you know, and I've been asking people what blood memory is. And they said, when you're out there and you feel sad or, you know, terror, or rage or whatever, you know, something happened there, at, you know, at certain sites and, you know, it seems like there needs to be a lot of healing. And I know the Mohawk people do this is uh, they come and get their spirits and take them back to the longhouse. You know, and maybe they could come here on our river and do that sometime because I know people talk about that now and then, but it's not you know, it needs to be healed because we all need each other. You know, like certain people like to mention that old stuff of their enmity, but uh, Tom Porter told me that was just the French and the English taking advantage of a situation by pitting us against one another. You know, and uh, we need to heal from a lot of things. But thank you, Margaret, for all the work you've done and everybody. I really, really appreciate that. And just your spirit. I loved roaming around with you the best. <laughs> and uh, just, you know, your perspective on it. I really enjoyed that and our friendship. And so, so grateful to all of you. Thank you. So um, one, of, one of the things that I... Um, really got out of uh, my place names work. Uh, first of all, this is huge recognition that um, decoding some of these place names really offered us a window into how our ancestors saw and used the landscape. And that was for someone who uh, studies history, that was a real kind of boost. And then I came across this uh, little formula by uh, Yifu Tuan. He was a cultural geographer and he said that space like an area plus culture, the people in that area equals place. And so you can take a, a place or a space like the Penobscot River Valley, and you can look at it from a, a main Eurocentric point of view, and you get a certain understanding of that place. Or you can take Penobscot culture and plug it in. This is a formula. You can change it. You get a different outcome. And so you get a different um, sense of place. So we can redefine the landscape as we start to decode uh, this and have an understanding of both the culture, the language, uh, those spaces, um, but also to Carol's point, also understand that, um, you know, history has not always been kind to us and, and we have historic trauma and that those uh, memories are also uh, embedded yeah. in, the in the landscape. Yeah. Yeah. And you're welcome, Carol. Thank you for sharing tonight. Mm -hmm. Thanks, James. I liked your uh, over your uh, maps. You know, I I don't have anything like that. <laughs> Just story and memory. Um, for I'm a person who, like, at the heart of the work I do and and what I study when when I used to study things. Um, is all my work is about friendship and collaboration and how friendship informs what people make um, and what is so important and, and beautiful for me tonight in hearing this is 
that yes, there's a lot of intellectual work in this, but it's your abject respect for one another, your friendship, your love, the family that that makes this work possible. Mm. I think in it, no single person on the screen could have created this map by themselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah, go ahead, James. Well, I, I just I just wanted to, um, you know, uh, uh, just point out Margaret's enthusiasm in this project. It was it was so infectious at times. She was always came in so excited. And I, and I remember I remember one day she we were kind of talking about what we're going to do for a um, a legend, you know, like uh, measurements of the map, you know, we can use miles or whatever. And and she came in and she's like, we should put looks. <laughs> and so, and, and I, I said, well, I, you, you know, because we, we measure distance. You, you tell someone you go 10 looks up the river, um, but, but looks it aren't a, a set measurement. It's you can't put it on a legend. And yeah. I just, but her, her enthusiasm, um, you know, I'm teasing her about this right now, but um, really it's more about her enthusiasm and, and about wanting to uh, get out this product that, um, that is amazing. You know, I don't, we couldn't have uh, made a map like this without, without your expertise. And um, I, I just wanted to personally thank you uh, for all your work around this market. Yeah, to Gaga Bimuk, it's as far as you can see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will be very in trouble if I don't ask the one question that is the most asked in this chat right now. <laughs> and it is, um, where can we purchase this map? <laughs> People would like to see it in, in, in person. And, and there are many um, native teachers and others in the chat who are wondering if they can order it for their classrooms and, and, um, and to have it as a, as a resource and to, and to do that. So if folks can help me, Margaret showing the, the realities, we do have some copies here in the map library um, as part of the collection. They're also up on the wall in our current exhibit, which looks at mapping Maine, the land and its peoples, um, and that James helped us out on with some map selection and some commentary, and that's up until the 20th. But where can people find one for their own? Um, Penobscot Nation Museum. So um, Penobscot dot museum at penobscotnation.org or you could email uh, Jennifer Neptune directly at jennifer.neptune at penobscotnation.org. I will put that in the chat and will you be warning Jen about all of these emails that will be coming her way? Um, yeah, I'm in trouble already by <laughs> just putting her email uh, out there, so. <laughs> um. I don't okay. think we mentioned that all of the artwork on the map is by James Francis Sr. Mm. It was fun. Yeah. Carol, one thing, one thing you said, when you said that Margaret said, uh, well, um, when you said that, that Margaret said um, that you just healed the world, healed the word, yeah. Uh, it made me think of the other thing that comes out of this work is that the words, the, the place names, um, the, this process often healed a lot of place names from another sense is that a, a bunch of them we only knew not from first language speakers, but from kind of some kind of fragmented representation of it on some kind of map. But in bringing the words together in one place and comparing and contrasting them and comparing and contrasting the stories that go with them, a lot of those words that like would have sort of sat there being kind of not known or not directly understandable um, kind of got re refilled um, yeah. by their relationship by being able us to be able to relate them to other words that we knew better um, they got re they came back to life basically they, they were healed in a sense uh, in, in a particularly direct sense and it, it came from this work yeah relating those words yeah I never thought of it that way till she mentioned it Um, there's an interesting, I, I'll, we have a lot of students with us tonight um, from all kinds of places and I would like to um, honor their, their questions and some space ar around that, or at least for some student names that I recognize as we, as we wrap up and, and, and one of mine is asking that 
you know, in your initial motivations and intentions for creating this version of, of the map, um, if you would share some of those motivations, but he's also wondering, did those intentions change over the course of the project? Did, did that change as you worked together and built something? Um, I, I, yeah, I, most definitely, you know, um, uh, I had worked with Margaret on um, a previous map. Uh, we were both consultants on the um, Thoreau Wabanaki Trail map. And um, we had always kind of just talked about um, wanting to really do this sort of place names map. Um, but I think the way that it really changed and um, it's kind of, the narrative that's written on the on the map kind of encapsulates this, but um, we found that you know you you can get really close to a place name and you can really kind of dig in deep and be very regional and like very close and try to figure out what it is. Um, but we found that when we really step back and we we look at also the portage routes, um, the canoe routes that were there, uh, that we really got a broader sense of the homeland. And I think this map really captures that. And that's why, um, you know, the canoe routes is so, so important because, um, you know, that kind of travel is so embedded in this landscape is because what, it's what our ancestors did. And I think that um, that kind of came through in this project. And uh, yeah, I'm pretty happy that had happened. I'll second that. And then also the stories. The like this, like the canoe routes, the stories explain and connect all the, the names. Mm -hmm. Similar kind of to what Connor's saying too, which is that it's not the individual names, it's when everything comes into relation right. that we understand. Yeah, Gabe, would you tell the story of what you just found out about your grandfather in the first poll? Um, we got time. Uh, well, briefly, just that, um, kind of going through, I got, you know, a lot of relatives when you get into your family tree, it just keeps expanding much like the place names and, um, on my mother's father's side, um, my grandfather, that line, um, I found took me further over into New Brunswick, well, what is now known as New Brunswick. And all of my great, great, so many uncles had hunting territories over there. And um, my last name, a man came, uh, actually had a, I think it's Sauconaway Sa River or something like that, yeah. off the St. Lawrence. And so that line carried me up through there, through the river, through the, um, place names out there and uh he was a uh, wine dot or a uh, huron and um so like eventually i want to go up there and visit those those places too i thought it interesting where you said he was an intermediary between the iroquois and the algonquin and look at you you're in language and how good you are you know we uh -huh. There is still a, a desire for someone to uh, explain one more time the meaning of K E A G. I was just about this. End say. of place names. <laughs> yeah, I saw that pop up a lot. Yeah, it's uh, K E A G locative that means at, in, or on. Like Bunawapskeg, Madawamkeg, Pasidumkeg. That makes complete sense why it shows up in so many places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, pass it on cake means above the gravel bar, but it actually means uh, at, at the place that's above the gravel bar. Yeah. So we're not going to have time to um, get to all 47 questions in the chat. <laughs> But we will get the list and I will, just for folks who, who asked, I, I will do some follow-up and the questions don't disappear into the ether. They'll come with me, um, to me, um, and we'll be able to, to reach out and, and get responses to some of those things. Um, I just wanna offer on just, I don't know, I just, uh, just a profound sense of thanks 
and gratitude for being able to just listen to this conversation this evening um, about place and, and how deeply place is held within our bodies mm -hmm. and our knowing and our families um, and how that displacement can affect us so negatively in so many ways and how much that this work that you're doing is helping people. Kara, like you're saying, healing the word or just healing the person and in their broken connection to places. Mm -hmm. And I think there's just so much of a, a desire you can see in the chat. There's just profound gratitude for sharing and being willing to share this um, and being willing and, and open to share this work and this process. And I think it's, it's inviting a lot of other people to to want to do this too in, in their own way and, and to collaborate on an even larger imagining of, of, of this work. So we're quite grateful. And I, um, out of respect to the elder among us, Carol, I would like to ask if you have any final words for us as we close out this evening. Well, just that. Uh, places like they hold memory and like James said it hasn't always been good you know but maybe we can heal some of that you know I wish that we had a ceremony like uh, the other tribe where you could go and get your spirit back and I think to me in this process like we're all trying to get our spirit back you know in a good way and uh it is very healing for everybody, I think. I'm just grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. Willi Wani. Gamanch Willi Wani. Willi Wani. Thank you to everyone who's joined in. Um, I will share with everyone on the panel. I've never seen so many comments in a Q&A. Now it's over 60. When I get the printout, I will share them with you um, also to see the expressions so you can see the expressions of gratitude and, and thanks. And, and, and specifically, you know, I just want to close out with a comment that Mike Lewin made because I think it, it, it speaks to what this work does and so much to what Jared was sharing earlier about his own experience. And Mike says, my father lost touch with the tribe before I was born. And I've had this nagging desire to learn what my family has forgotten. And this is so powerful. And I think that this is what helps us to, to connect and to heal and to move forward. So mm -hmm. with my profound gratitude for your time and your wisdom and your work um, and everyone who sat with us to, to listen tonight in community, we are incredibly grateful. There's been a lot of questions. Did we record this? Yes, we will be happy to share it. I would ask your patience. We're still in a pandemic. It takes a little bit to process a video and to share, um, but we will share that through the Osher Map Library um, Facebook site and, and, and YouTube site. And then also all of the panelists will get copies to share however they wish to do so in their own time and in their own community. So thank you everybody and we'll see you when we see you thank you